fine. Welcome back to the video media equivalent of rubbing your balls on a cheese grater. Yes, indeed. It's time for regrets. Stug Run Part 3. Uh, Trib, it's been ages. Why'd you take so long? You know damn well why. If I didn't make this clear already, this run has about as much fun value as four hangnails. Uh, but anyways, I previously scripted up a much larger opening to this part, but I want to get you as much content here as possible without an inflated intro. Uh, so here's the stuff that I'm going to say real fast. First, if you've not seen the series before, check out part one and two for for an explanation. Second, there is a slight change to the platinum rule. I'm allowing myself to buy platinum if I need to, though I'm not allowed to use it to buy frames. This was done just to avoid any major time gates while still keeping in spirit with the run. I'll let you know if I purchase any though. And three, we last left off with me trying to get Oberon, but unfortunately since part two, his parts were moved to the rail jack in the Vale Proxima, which has uh, this level range. So yeah, I scrapped that and decided that I would deal with that issue later down the line. With all that said, let's continue. Following the failed Tinder date between this blue square and this D-pad, I ventured forth to conquer the Saturn Junction, and this time around was an ember, and there is really not much to say. She just didn't hold a candle to the Frost Junction, but she still managed to fry me like egg once, and then I came back and blew up her favorite star in retaliation. After that, I came across a sabotage mission type that I completely forgot about. The one where you destroy the crypto mining equipment. It's also a pretty simple mission. Just shoot the three mining rigs. Except DE, with their god-given wisdom and wiseness beyond the years of humanity, declared from atop the greatest mountain they could find, Lamau. Because the Stug can't damage these machines! And look, at this, at this point, we all get the joke. This thing makes Pee Wee Herman look like Brock Lesnar. I'd be more afraid of Steve Urkel with a pool noodle than a SEAL Team 6 member wielding this thing. But seriously? <laughs> anyway, problems that shouldn't exist call for answers that shouldn't exist. Namely, getting the enemies whose job is to stop the machines from being shot to shoot the machines for me. I wish I was joking. Following this, I continued my domination of Saturn, and for the most part, it wasn't too interesting. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of nodes that you've already seen before. But one of the requirements to access the Uranus Junction is this. Neat. So off I went to shove Ruck into the dumpster, but not before he reminded me of a horrible fate that awaits me at the end of all of this. Regret. I know, man! Anyway, Ruck wasn't anything too hard. He primarily just did one of two things. Either he walked around like a confused grandma outside of the local target, or two, I can't fucking see! Luckily, my fear of the Stug not working on him or his weak point because Stug things was ill-found. He took damage just fine, and I didn't really struggle with him, praise the fucking lords. After that, I extracted, put his face onto my chest, and Saturn was finally cleared. Now I just needed to face the junction. The last requirement wanted me to open three Meso relics, so I did that, and we can now challenge the Uranus Junction. Surprise, surprise, it's Equinox, who I think hits pretty goddamn hard with their gun. I say think because I kind of just brought Rhino, activated Iron Skin, and tanked at all. And unlike other Junction Spectres, she made absolutely no effort to block or dodge, so we kind of just stared at each other and agreed that victory should be decided by a DPS check. As you can see, I was perfectly fine with that. You know the drill, I be toxic, I explode planet, get a not stug, and we continue on our way. With Uranus unlocked, it then occurred to me that we may have a new problem. Submergible missions. Specifically exterminate, but I decided that I would deal with that problem when we got to it. You know what's cool? Being unable to use my only weapon underwater, and thus having to constantly pull submerged enemies towards dry land so that I can aim into the wet hole just to get the kills that I need. But anyway, my goal now was to gain access to the Nata quest, as it is necessary to do for node progression. So instead of dealing with Uranus in full right now, I instead made a beeline for that. I jumped into the nearest capture node and was met with the sentient drones. So I scanned them and were now ready to initiate the quest. For this mission, 
Ribbon. Reb sends me down to Earth to scan some sentient chopsticks. Along the way, we find a big chopstick as Reb commands that I go scan some more drones. As I do so, for some reason she immediately forgets what she requested of me because she asks what I just saw. This game certainly does video sometimes. After scanning the stick figures, Reb then abandons me. At this point, I've gotten used to it. Between having played the quest on my main account, her second full abandonment in a later quest, and getting barred from the new partner program, this isn't exactly anything new. I don't blame her though, my power is frightening. Back on the ship, Teshin shows up and proposes that we space dox Lotus in retaliation for her poor parenting. And so we do. A few uneventful mobile defenses later, we have Teal Regor's email address and read one of his messages. It seems that Teal has located a tomb of sorts that has the possibility of creating a cure for his people's cloning decay syndrome. A disease that drastically shortens lifespans, eats away at the brain, and causes horrible skin mutations for all of Grenier kind. A miracle cure would drastically increase the living quality of the Grenier people and save them from generations of utter hell. <laughs> and you know we can't let that happen. And so I'm sent to capture Teal's lackey for more information on this tomb. After stuffing him into my hand, we now know the location. And so we head off to meet Teal Daddy. Turns out, the thing inside of said tomb is Han Hao, an extremely high-ranking sentient, which is an artificial race that played a crucial role in the extinction of the greatest and most powerful civilization in the known universe. And the one in this grave is known as the quote, sentient destroyer of worlds. Tail decides that opening this fuckbox would be a great idea. And soon, he succeeds, and is, for some reason, bewildered that he's, quote, not alone, despite being fully aware mere minutes ago that the tomb did indeed contain someone else. And, much like an offshore drilling company when they cause an oil spill, Teal gets the fuck out of Dodge and abandons all responsibility for his little fucky-wucky. After extracting, we're told to, uh, explode the fuck out of the grave, which is rad. So back down I go. As the bomb is being armed, we're given the history behind Lotus and this burnt bionicle, and I assume it was really interesting. I don't know for sure, because my brain shut off for the whole agonizing 17 minutes of sitting through 10 ways of Grenier with a weapon that shoots toe fungus. But eventually, I'm done. We do a little grave desecration, Teal gets mad at me, and I get a tomato adapter for my troubles. With the Ta quest completed, I set out to finish my conquest of Uranus. And not much worth noting happened, except for an Arcwing interception, which is just as AIDS as it sounds. Being unable to fire my weapon means that I simply had to juke and jive from one tower to the next, hoping that enemies would let me hold onto them long enough to beat them in point count. Anyone who's played this game knows that sometimes enemies in interception are chill, barely even trying to cap the points. But other times, they just won't lay the fuck off and have dedicated hit squads rubbing their balls on every point. So take that problem and add in the inability to fight back. So I had to keep using blink teleports to lure enemies away from the points, then blink back in and get whatever cap progress was possible before they made their way back. And since I couldn't actively stop them from capping points, I just had to focus on deactivating whatever they captured as quickly as possible. Eventually, I was able to reach 100% before they did. But then, I was reminded of something. Kill the remaining enemies. If you'll recall from previous parts, there's simply no possible way for me to kill enemies here. There's just no option that will let me kill them without the game determining them to be non-stug kills. So, I abandoned the mission, pulled in a manslave, and had them slay the enemies for me. The good news is that I already showed that I could do the actual interception part of the mission alone, so no challenge was missed here. And now, an old mission type returns that I've been dreading at this level. Disruptions. True, I did a disruption with Grenier on Mars in a previous part, but the level of that node was pretty low, and this one is vastly different. It's on a dark sector node for one thing, and it's infested, and it has level 30 enemies. And if you didn't know, there's a pretty noticeable difficulty spike for enemies when they hit this level range. Anyway, without talking for too long, this was the most difficult wall that I had to deal with by far, at least up to this point. I just did not have enough deeps to kill a demolist, and I needed to kill one in order to be able to extract. So, after faffing about with my options, I ultimately decided that I needed to stall the demolist to make up for my lack of damage. But how do I do that when I can't use CC powers? Well, I developed a pretty big brain IQ play. 
my feet. Specifically, I'm talking about Ice Spring, since Demolists are affected by the Ice proc. So, to make a long story short, I did some nightmare missions so that I could sell something for Platt so that I could just buy the Ice Spring instead of having to farm fucking sabotage catches for it. And eventually, I got my hands on a Hammer Shot, a highly sought after nightmare mod that sells for about 60 platinum. This was perfect, as I could not only buy my Ice Spring, but I also had plenty left over to get at least one Warframe slot. Saucy. I decided to put it up on Warframe.market at a slight discount, and about 20 minutes later, I had a buyer. Thanks, po Pojevrny Tiger. You saved me from a second lifetime of torture and misery. Also, thanks for the free demon fish. With my new wealth in hand, I bought Ice Spring off of a certain gay body, mainly because I couldn't be arsed to wait on the market again. And so I went back to the node. It took a few attempts, but I finally got a good demolist spawn early, and it was time to see if this was worth the effort. Turns out it was, because I was finally able to take down a demolist just barely, thanks to a bunch of ancients slowing me down. After that nightmare, it was back to business as usual. And two nodes later, it was time to fight Lucas, aka Teal. Teal has a unique property that I completely forgot about. Not only does he have shields, but they constantly regenerate. This alone is problematic to my ammo economy, but add in the fact that he's extremely mobile and can also teleport, and I was actually in fear whether I would have enough ammo to kill him. Luckily, with my scientific mind, I developed the largest IQ strategy that I could come up with. Not moving. The only time Teal is not teleporting all over the place is when he's smashing your face in with his fists, which is handy as Teal has no consistent ranged attacks outside of shooting said fists. Because of this, he tends to want to close the gap pretty often. So I just popped Iron Skin, stood still, and face tanked all of his attacks, taking advantage of his inability to teleport away to get big damage off. Once I figured this out, he fell pretty fast. I asserted dominance like usual. This is towards Teal, not you, Lucas don't worry. And off I went. That's another planet down, and now it was time for the junction. I just had to complete five Uranus missions with only a melee equipped first. And can- <laughs> Can I just point out how easily this requirement could have been something that would have just completely invalidated the run? Thank God I'm not required to use my melee. So, after spamming some rescue missions, off I went to once again ruin an AI's day. Our victim this time was a Loki, who didn't put up much of a fight, but I will admit gave me a mini panic attack when he disarmed me, until I realized that there was literally nothing stopping me from just taking my stug back out again. Anyway, you know the deal. Twink goes down, Dummy time, planet goes kaboom, millions are dead. With this junction, we also unlocked a crucial quest, the second dream. And so, I jumped right in. Looks like the stalker found the Omega Chopstick corpse somehow, and after pretending that the Loki I just killed was his, Hunhao is like, Hey, there's a bunch of children in something called the Reservoir somewhere. You wanna go kill them? Yeah, dope. Lotus thinks this is uncool, so I'm sent to stop the child murderers. Looks like the Grenier, and their ongoing quest to be the fuckest of wits, have uncovered fragments of Hun Hao, which is a problem, as even just a part of him being awakened means that he can communicate and share thoughts with his other parts, one of which just might be inside of Lotus. And that might be how he knows where the reservoir is. Anyway, Hun Hao talks about how he found us and how he's gonna kill us and shit, seemingly unaware that I've been through more torture than he could ever dish out, as I find a space email addressed to the Lotus. Following extraction, it looks like the one who sent said email is- Oh for fuck's sake! Alad tells us that he knows where a fragment of Hun Hao is, which Lotus could use to pinpoint the stalker's whereabouts by reading into Hun Hao's memory. While I'm suffering listening to Alad be horny over voice chats, he directs me to where a said fragment is. Lotus drops a twist about how Hun Hao is actually her father dearest, which would be shocking if he didn't already explain that a whole quest ago. But here's an even better twist. The Lotus got jabated. Turns out, Hun Hao didn't actually know where the reservoir was, that was just a bluff. But by reading into this fragment's memory with her own in order to ascertain the stalker's whereabouts, she indirectly gave the location to her daddy. Having seen the path to the reservoir, the stalker follows it, and we're sent in pursuit. And eventually, we wind up going through a void portal. So we're near the space children, but where exactly are they? Turns out, they're on the motherfucking moon, dude! So Somehow, this chick hit a whole ass planetary body in a void pocket, and I feel that we don't talk about this enough. Anywho, the stalker then makes a run for the moon, and we give chase once more. And in another big brain play, Hun Hao decides to attempt to destroy the reservoir by collapsing the void space around the moon, crushing 
it along with the moon children, creating an ultimatum. Take the moon out of the void and expose it to the sentience, or do nothing and let the moon fucking explode. We decide to take the former choice. After doing a bunch of void realignment junk and having the stalker banish me to the space between worlds briefly, the moon is back where it belongs. Bad news, the combat chopsticks can now attack it. Whoops. Back down I go. And after some walking, we finally find the reservoir. And out comes... Uh, me. My frame, finally fed up and drained from everything it's been forced through, decides to have a little nappy. Unfortunately, I could not allow it or myself to rest yet, for we still have a lot of work to do. The stalker then shows up, but apparently decides to not kill me for reasons, and then he disappears. Huh. Lotus spouts some shit about a hidden power that I have, and maybe I do, maybe I don't, but I can't attack enemies with it anyway. Space hand lasers are not stugs. But now I've hit a huge wall, because countless pissed off Bionicles then spawn in and try to kill me. And they whittle down all of my health to nothing before I can get anywhere close to extraction. <laughs> Just kidding, I can't die. Why? Who knows? But it's a major break that I really needed because honestly, I didn't see how I was going to be able to get through this without killing the sentience otherwise. As I feel the angry chopsticks crawling on my back, I walk my slow ass to extraction. And it was finally time to deposit the kid into the space chair. Except never mind, because the stalker changed his mind again and... Wants to kill me now? What? Anyways, I'm supposed to shoot the stalker with my newfound hand laser, but I refuse. Instead, I juke and jive with the grace of a grandma with nine hip replacements. Luckily, I'm also invincible here too, which is good because I get hit by a ton of sword beams. But eventually, I manage to charge the kitty chair. Stalker stabs other me in the chest, but using the power of the thug, I'm able to break the blade, which is apparently enough to fuck with Hun Hao, despite already being in multiple pieces. You know, from, from a fucking bomb? Well, whatever. I give my operator the only appropriate look I can think of, choose Zanurik as my starting focus school, and we finally completed the second dream. With that squared away, it was time to take over Neptune. And some nodes later, I needed to deal with the hyena pack. So, how did it go? Well, it's a boss. I had zero difficulty with him, thank god, and there's also another nice bonus to fighting them. Hyena drops Loki, who might be quite useful thanks to his invisibility and teleports. I did it far for him now, but still, good to know. With that, Neptune is officially done, and heading into the junction, it was Excalibur's time to shine. Poster Boy here, ironically, put up the weakest fight out of every Solar Rail Warden so far. You know that Indiana Jones scene where the dude is like, flourishing his sword and, and he just shoots the dude with a gun. That's kind of what this was. For some reason, the AI was incapable of both blocking and attacking at the same time. So he just kept getting stuck in his stupid block flourish until he eventually died and vaporized, seemingly from embarrassment. Though, he did manage to flashbang me once. After that, it was on to Pluto. We're coming up to the final stretch now, and yet, we still have a ton of work to do. Speaking of, Pluto introduces us to our next gigantic hurdle. Ambulus. Ambulus has a number of traits specifically designed to fuck me over. For one, I won't be able to just, you know, go fight Ambulus. DE wants me to farm for my ability to challenge it. And okay, fine, but one problem. Ambulus is tanky as fuck. I simply do not have the ammo to kill these fucking things. And I wasn't even sure if doing the actual boss fight was gonna be possible. But for now, I needed to actually have enough tokens to fucking get to it. So I looked up the price of a basic pistol ammo mutation and bought one, as it was only five platinum. So now, at least ammo wasn't a major worry. And after that, I was able to get my hands on the tokens needed to challenge the boss. And like getting a needle, I decided I should deal with Ambi before clearing the rest of Pluto. And my worries turned out to be true. Boss Ambulus has a fuck ton of damage reduction. And remember, I'm also on a fucking time limit. Plus, I need to kill it four times. Ambulus was a critical test on my knowledge and ability to hit weak points. There simply is not enough time to kill it by just wildly covering it in balls. Specifically, I needed to focus on its head and leg packs to deal damage. And after I did that, I needed to make damn fucking sure that no corpus reprogrammed it. If that happened, I wouldn't have enough time to get its health back down to rehack it. Which sucks because crewmen reactivate the ambuli in 
incredibly fast. I only get about two seconds to kill them before I have to deal with the Ambulus a second time. Ambulus has so far been the hardest boss. From the time limit to its demands that I aim properly to the fact that I have to be on my fucking A game to prevent it from being reactivated. I also needed a bit of luck. If the Ambulus decides to just walk around and keep hiding its head from me, there wasn't much that I could do. The best outcome was for the shit and thing to do its shockwave stomps, but it only does those when it feels like it. Each new ambulance also becomes harder to deal with as well. After one, more enemies spawn in. After two, artillery begins getting shot at my soft boy hole. After the third, more enemies spawn in, scrambuli come into play, and a second ambulance spawns in just to be a prick. All of this was ridiculously annoying. Seriously, this boss can go fuck itself. I rarely get angry at video games, but this actually got me fuming a bit. But after a countless number of attempts, I was able to take the damn things down, and I got to witness a beautiful ship explosion. But, after I got back to the ship, I was given some terrible news. The greatest fear that has been lingering over my head this entire run had come true. I did my usual stat inspection to make sure that I was still in line with the run, and there I saw it. Somehow, somewhere along the line, I had gotten a kill not registered to the stug. <laughs> what caused it? I wish I knew. There's a good chance that the cause was a grenade that an enemy threw. I probably exploded it with a stray stug shot, causing a kill that is not technically classified as a stug kill. This was something that I had to deal with in previous parts, but in the past, I was able to recognize that it had happened and kill my game executable before it could register to my profile. But this time, I just didn't catch it. Likely, this happened somewhere within all the chaos of the ambulance fight, and since this number was the entire win condition, there is no rule skirting here. This challenge had failed. But I couldn't just end the run here. The spirit of this run is to see if there's any unavoidable obstacles that would prevent it from succeeding. So whilst I wasn't able to complete it flawlessly, I still needed to prove that it could or could not be done. The run still continues, but it's no longer for my own glory. I would no longer get my dream of a golden stug skin at the end of all this torture. But now, this run is for everyone. And with this unfortunate event, I think I'm going to call this part here. I think I mentioned before just how time intensive this run is. Warframe is not a game that respects your time at all. I probably don't need to tell you that. Still, I think we can all agree that this part took a little too long. And I know that I said this last time, but I fucking mean it this time. You will get what is hopefully the final part to this much sooner, barring any major problems. Problems, anyways. The run might be kill, but I still have a lot of crying in the shower to do. So, until then, uh, bye bye.